on this Wednesday night, overwhelmed and under fire. Alberta's vaccine booking system buckles. And all of a sudden it says uh, servers not available. As confusion spreads over a patchwork of plans throughout Ontario. International travelers ignoring hotel quarantine orders Why police won't stop them. Potential new hope about the fate of the two Michaels. Plus, powering the NHL forward. I was just wanting to get hired. I, I wasn't thinking about, you know, being the first black official and calling out offside behavior both on and off the ice, the inspiring and historic career of Jay Sharers. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. As more vaccines are delivered to Canada, the pressure is on the provinces to administer them. And in some places, it's not going smoothly. In Alberta, the online booking system was overwhelmed shortly after it went live at 8 a.m. People aged 75 and older there are eligible to be vaccinated, but many Albertans complained they couldn't access the site. Each province has their own strategy and criteria for vaccine rollout, and the number of doses being given is slowly on the rise. More than 1.16 million Canadians have now received at least one dose of either the Pfizer-BioNTech or Moderna vaccine. 40% of them, more than 470,000 people, have received the second shot and are now fully vaccinated. Ontario and Quebec have administered the most doses, more than 600,000 in Ontario and more than 300,000 in Quebec. The vaccine rollout is in a race with the more transmissible variants. Cases of those are on the rise in a number of places in Canada. Quebec reported a 24% jump in presumptive cases involving variants of concern in just 24 hours. It's a concern, too, in Ontario. Toronto health officials say 200 additional suspected cases of variants have been identified in the past two days. The provinces have had months to work on getting their systems and people in place to administer the vaccines. In our top story tonight, Abigail Beeman looks at how it's going so far. Just a little wheel goes around and then all of a sudden it says uh, servers not available. When Alberta's vaccine bookings opened at 8 a.m. for seniors 75 and older, Gary Mason was ready. The system wasn't. I had two phones going too. I also phoned the 811 number on my landline and my cell phone. And th th they, they just, they just, Kept ringing busy. So we expect there will be enormous demand for immunization. We have increased staffing for HealthLink to make sure that any senior who wants an appointment can get an appointment as quickly as possible. But we know this will take weeks to achieve. They put up their website and bang, it's crashed. We want to make sure we nail this. We have it down pat. Ontario plays defense over criticism its booking website won't be live until March 15th. Certain eligible, vulnerable people can make appointments this week, not just in Alberta, but Quebec and Manitoba too. First Nations people in Manitoba older than age 75 can now make appointments. Wednesday, Ontario announced a few new details. Those 80 and older can book the third week of March. 75 and up can book April 15th, 70 and older, May 1st, and so on. We will be able to start with a essential workers the first week in May. But exactly who qualifies hasn't been decided. And since the 34 public health units are tasked with coming up with local plans, the details become more confusing. Ottawa, for example, is launching its own booking portal first and starting vaccination for those 80 and older in the hardest hit neighborhoods March 5th, 10 days earlier than the province-wide plan. We are once again leading the province uh, in providing the vaccine to our residents. British Columbia is also facing criticism for being slow. It's promising more details on Monday, especially for those 80 and older. The top doctor says BC has more seniors than Alberta. Ontario's premier used a similar line, saying Ontario in general has a much larger population than Alberta, but vaccines coming from Ottawa are generally allocated on a per capita basis. Abigail Beeman, Global News, Ottawa. There is some potentially promising news about the Johnson & Johnson single-dose vaccine. Scientists at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration reviewed data and have concluded the vaccine is safe and effective and prevents hospitalizations from COVID-19. Johnson & Johnson's own studies found it has varying degrees of effectiveness against the variants, but overall is 66% effective. The FDA meets on Friday to decide whether to authorize emergency use of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Health Canada is still reviewing it. Canada has pre-ordered 10 million doses of it. 
to try to limit new infections from entering the country. New rules are in place for air travelers, but some passengers seem to be skirting them. International travelers are now required to quarantine for three days in a government-approved hotel at their own expense. But how exactly is that being enforced? Sean O'Shea is looking into that for us tonight. Donna, the new airport quarantine rules rely heavily on the honor system. When travelers touch down in Canada, they're supposed to go to a designated hotel like this one, but they're not forced. Since Monday morning, it's the law. International passengers arriving in Vancouver, Calgary, Montreal, and here in Toronto must go straight from the airport into a quarantine hotel, whether they like it or, in this case, not. I literally have no choice. I don't want to be here. The new rules have few fans. Three day hotel quarantine, it's a joke. But defying the rules wouldn't be right, this Canadian traveler told us. No, I, w I don't want to break the rules because everybody has to be safe. You know, I know they're doing it for a reason and, you know, we all have to do our part. But police admit that on Monday and Tuesday, some travelers did refuse. Uh, the federal government has now put in place quarantine measures that are designed to protect our community. Uh, it's unfortunate uh, that, uh, that what you're describing might be occurring. Some on social media saying they'd rather pay a fine than obey. And I hope that people do abide by um, the, the new stricter guidelines when it comes to um, your responsibilities. But if someone doesn't choose to follow the rules here at Pearson Airport, police won't stop them. Enforcement is entirely in the hands of the Public Health Agency of Canada, which declined our request for an on-camera interview. Up until Sunday, Peel Police handed out 49 tickets to travelers who refused a mandatory COVID-19 test at the airport. That's an $880 provincial fine. But now with the stricter hotel quarantine in effect, they're not charging anyone. Someone could ignore the quarantine rule and just go home. Tempting, some say. I feel like it. <laughs> but you risk a $3,000 fine or more, the cost of breaking the federal quarantine rules. And even though police won't stop you here, government inspectors could find you later. This woman says the quarantine isn't so bad. Three days, it's okay, not 14 days. You must stay at the quarantine hotel until the results of the airport quarantine test come back and the balance of that 14 days at home. Inconvenient, pricey, unpopular, but most travelers are doing it, Donna. All right, Sean O'Shea in Mississauga tonight, thanks. A security guard hired to do quarantine compliance has been charged with sexual assault and extortion after an incident at a woman's home in Oakville, Ontario. Halton Regional Police say the accused, a 27-year-old Hamilton man, demanded the woman pay a fine in cash, and when she refused, it's alleged she was sexually assaulted. Police say the man worked for one of four private security firms hired to enforce the mandatory 14-day quarantine requirements. Authorities are concerned there may be other victims and they are appealing for them to come forward. New information is always emerging as vaccines are rolled out and now France is considering whether giving a single dose instead of two to people who have already had COVID-19 would keep them from being reinfected. That could free up millions of doses. Preliminary data is showing some promise, but at this point, the research is limited. Crystal Gamancing looks at what we know and don't know. Every jab is providing protection against COVID-19. Officials in England shared data from two studies showing reduced disease with a single shot and a 75% drop in hospitalization and death in elderly people. Overall, we're seeing a really strong effect to reducing any infection, asymptomatic and asymptomatic. This is the first time that this has been done in a, symptoma, in a systematic way for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. With more being learned about the vaccines, France is looking to try something new. The country's health minister is expected to decide soon if people who have had the virus will get just one shot. Everything we're doing in terms of vaccine doses is safe in terms of people taking it. Um, the risks are largely in the other direction. Is this going to be sufficient to protect the person who gets vaccinated in the long term? Two small studies from the U.S. out of Mount Sinai Medical School and the University of Maryland showed a single dose in people who have already contracted COVID-19 provided at least the same amount of protection as two shots in people who haven't been infected. The data has not been peer-reviewed. If France makes the switch to a single dose, it could maximize vaccine supply. The reality is, and we've seen in Canada, you know, we are at the level of resource uh, scarcity when things, supply chains dry up and that type of thing. So, 
you know, it, there is something to be said about doing this. Citing evolving knowledge, the health authority in France updated its opinion, saying those who have been infected should wait a minimum of three months before getting a single shot. Collecting this data now in real time is going to be super important for the rest of the world to get the most optimal vaccine strategy. It doesn't appear any other country is considering this strategy for people who have had the virus. Crystal Gamansen, Global News, London. Prime Minister Trudeau faced questions today about whether he was briefed about allegations against Canada's former top soldier. General Jonathan Vance is accused of inappropriate behaviour with two female subordinates. The Defence Minister has said several times any information that was brought forward was taken to the appropriate authorities. Today, the Prime Minister said this. I first learned of allegations against General Vance in Global News reporting. We have no tolerance for any form of sexual misconduct. We have launched an independent investigation uh, and uh, we have confidence that it will uh, go underway appropriately. One of the women accusing Vance has spoken to Global News. Major Kelly Brennan claims she was involved in a long-standing intimate relationship with him. Vance denies all allegations. Prime Minister Trudeau's meeting yesterday with the U.S. President Joe Biden has raised hope about the fate of the two Michaels, Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor, who have been in custody in China for more than two years. Biden named the two men and said he would work with Canada on getting them released. What does that mean in practical terms, though? David Aiken looks into what action might follow Biden's words. Human beings are not bartering chips. It was the strongest oh, statement yet from Canada's yeah. most important ally, a U.S. Canada president mentioning States by name the two Canadians, Michael Spavor and Michael Covering. Covering, excuse me. Detained in retaliation for the 2017 arrest by RCMP of Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou on a U.S. extradition warrant. Kovrig's sister, Ariana Buza, seen here with her brother, listened carefully to the president and told Global News on Wednesday that Biden's words were music to my ears, but I've been listening to statements, commitments, and pledges for over two years, yet nothing has changed for the better for my brother or Michael Spavor. I do have more hope in this administration, attempting to follow through on securing their freedom, but for now... They are still just words. The government of China curtly dismissed Biden's comments, with a spokesman saying China's judicial sovereignty allows no interference. Still, China watchers say Biden's intervention is significant. So that was very strong language, and, uh, and that means that there's going to be a new and strong um, voice for their release, and so that's very welcome. Biden must now follow up and continue to press the case of the two Michaels whenever he meets Chinese leaders. I think what we're seeing is that China is finally getting the message that there are costs and consequences to their actions. One thing Biden cannot do is press his Justice Department to drop the case against Meng. That case is being handled by an independent judicial process on both sides of the border. And even if this case was resolved and Meng was free to return to China, experts say there are no guarantees China would quickly or automatically release the detained Canadians. As for the two Michaels, on Wednesday, they marked 807 days in a Chinese prison. David Aiken, Global News, Ottawa. The future is also uncertain tonight for Tiger Woods. Doctors say he is lucky to be alive. He's recovering from emergency surgery after his vehicle went off the road and rolled down an embankment in California. The 45-year-old was alone in the SUV when it veered off the road south of L.A. Trauma specialists inserted a rod to stabilize his right tibia and used screws and pins to fix his foot and ankle bones. Woods is said to be awake and responsive. He was heading to a golf course to give celebrities golf tips when the crash happened. The airbags did deploy and he was wearing a seat belt. He was extricated through the windshield. I don't think he was aware of how gravely he was injured at the time. Um, it could be a, a mixture of adrenaline. Um, it could have been shock. The LA County Sheriff says it appears Woods may have been speeding. They have no evidence he was impaired. A collapse caught on camera coming up the moment the ground buckles at a cemetery.
Canada and the U.S. held high-level meetings today on climate policy. U.S. President Joe Biden has called climate change the existential threat of our time and has put the issue back at the top of the American foreign policy agenda. It is a sharp contrast to the past four years. Former President Trump often ignored or mocked climate science. Jackson Prosco reports on the shift in tone and what it could mean for Canada. U.S. leadership has been sorely missed uh, over the past uh, past years. The virtual meeting between President and Prime Minister Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. ended with a promise to tackle the real-world problem of climate change together. Canada and the United States are going to work in lockstep to display the seriousness of our commitment at both home and abroad. Work that continued behind closed doors Wednesday as high-level delegations from both countries met to work on common policies and shared targets. It's a wonderful thing to have uh, the Americans back at the table being thoughtful, progressive, and ambitious with respect to climate action. Early plans include potential North American vehicle emission standards, carbon taxes on imports from polluting countries, and overall emissions reductions meant to stop temperatures from rising beyond 1.5 degrees Celsius, the climate tipping point. This roadmap sets an, a very strong first step for both countries to work together uh, on a fairly ambitious agenda of re, you know, reshaping our economies around a rapid transition to clean energy. A Canada-U.S. climate pact is a dramatic shift from the past four years. We're going to cancel the Paris Climate Agreement. When President Donald Trump turned his back on international obligations. It is time to start treating the climate crisis like the urgent security threat that it is. The Biden administration has appointed a first-ever U.S. climate envoy, who this week brought his message to the U.N. Security Council in a bid to sway other nations, too. I am convinced it is literally our last best hope to get on track and to get this right. The Trudeau government insists working with the U.S. is also meant to send a message to the world. How Canada and the United States could work together to help other countries raise their level of ambition. For now, there is a promise to develop new promises. More concrete goals could be announced as soon as April, with the hope that binational cooperation makes it harder for either nation to walk away from commitments in the future simply because of a shift in the political winds. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Washington. Getting back into sheep shape, still ahead, a desperately needed makeover. You might say this guy is having a bad hairdo, hair day rather. Rescuers in Australia named this sheep Barak. They retrieved him from a forest where he'd apparently been running wild for a while. By the time his makeover was complete, he'd lost 35 kilograms of fleece. He's now got a new coat and is settling in with other sheep at a sanctuary. In Italy, something extraordinary happened. Part of a cemetery has collapsed. It's believed the landslide was caused by coastal erosion, aggravated by severe weather. Only 10 of about 200 coffins have been recovered. The surrounding area has been secured to stop any more from drifting away. A video shot by cemetery workers captured the moment it happened. Drones are now being used to assess the damage and monitor the stability of the remaining slope. Breaking barriers next, the BC man who made pro hockey history. Some milestones are better recognized late than never. It took many years for the National Hockey League to honor Willie O'Ree. He's the Maritimer who became the first black player in the league. Well, now another trailblazer from the town of Hope, B.C. is being recognized. Jay Scherers was the first black linesman and the first black official in the NHL. And he played an important role in making the game more diverse. Ross Lord has his story. The passing of time has helped Jay Scherer's reconsider his part in breaking a color barrier in pro hockey. When I first got hired by the NHL, I was just wanting to get hired. I, I wasn't thinking about, you know, being the first black official. In a position of authority over athletes and coaches, many of them were used to seeing people of color in lesser positions. His pioneering achievement in 1990 was barely acknowledged publicly. Also never mentioned was how he stared down racism, 
like verbal abuse from fans, mostly in lower leagues than the NHL, and even hurtful comments from his officiating colleagues. There was definitely things said sometimes in the locker room that were uh, unwarranted or insensitive. Rather than confront them with anger, sharers chose to educate others about the damaging impact of their words. That You don't realize how hurtful that is or what kind of pain that represents to things that my father went through when he immigrated from Jamaica to Canada and being married to a white woman in the late 50s, early 60s, that you just can't say those things. After officiating 2,000 NHL games, including the Stanley Cup Finals, and retiring in 2017, Sharers is proud. He excelled in a grueling job that eventually forced him to get a hip replacement. Along with pride, there's obligation. I definitely feel a sense of responsibility in terms of how I might be a role model for a young boy or girl who would look and see me and say, well, I look like him. Maybe there's a possibility or a chance that I could do it. That's exactly what happened. The guy's a little bit of a legend in our business, um, and, and especially for, for me. Shandor Alfonso says Sharers inspired him to become the NHL's second black on ice official. Jay didn't have anyone to, to look up to in, in his exact career coming up, so he kind of paved the way for us and, and let us know that it's possible. Sharers plans to promote officiating in his adopted home of St. Louis, hopefully attracting a wider range of prospects to the job he loved. Ross Lord, Global News. And that is Global National for this Wednesday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Your Canada is from Nova Scotia. The official African Nova Scotian flag went on display at Government House last night for the first time. It has been years in the making and was unveiled last week to mark African Heritage Month. It will be on display at Government House for special events. The new design features a stylized Sankofa, which symbolizes the need to learn from the past to build a successful future. Thanks for watching. Take care of yourselves. Bye bye.